recitation starts now for sir basan sir please come close to i request pidush kanti rai to come first you just <coughs> We'll give it to Pijush Kanti Rai. He is our Friday group member. We are all proud of him. He is designated by Supreme Court. Congratulations, sir. Justice Basan sir is very prominent, ah, very vocal, and very topmost criminal lawyer and uh, constitutional lawyer of this country. Thank you very much, sir. Now I uh, request V. Prabhakar sir. He also designated as senior advocate. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Sir. Aristotle is here. Aristotle. Joseph, please, Aristotle. Yeah. He's also our Friday group member. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now, who is this? Raghavendra. Uh, Raghavendra Srivastava, please come. Um, is also a friday group member why we are doing we are all encouraging you this friday group is encouraging to become a judges or a advocate general part of a senior designation so that's a great inspiration great inputs i am getting everyone appreciated our own not only our members other senior sir also will say few words after this let some now finally Thank mr paruka is a today's uh, main speaker and other thing he to designate earlier also he addressed some I will request one by one. Pujesh will say one or a uh, uh, few words, sir. Please. Make closer. Yes. Better. Better. Respected Basan uh, sir, <coughs> Shishu, my good friend, and good evening to everybody. I post a message in my LinkedIn message. There's a reality. I just want to share some part of it. I started my journey from Calcutta. I started in a municipal school where English was really very embargo for us to know. You might be knowing there was a policy by the government of West Bengal sometimes till class five there will be no English. Only Bengali will be there. Since I was the government school, so I have to follow the norms. But I didn't stop my journey over there. I was very good in uh, trying to be good in my study. Then I stood not first, but I got the first division in my Mathematics exam from Calcutta, uh, from the you know, West Bengal Board of Secondary Education. Similarly. I, w I was very good in this, my secondary education. Then I got in, uh, admitted to my law course, Calcutta University. Finished my law course, started my practice in High Court at Calcutta. From there, after one and a half year practice, I shifted to, I was planning to go for abroad to do my masters. I, I got scholarship for the Helsinki University. It was the my unique university. I think that Finnish education nowadays has come. It's the best education in the world. Really, it is good. So I did really, I put a mark in my, uh, my LLM course. India was known in different way, maybe because of, uh, that time only I was in India and uh, we had 32 students from 32 countries. And I was only Indian in my course. My some article like Unit in Diversity was my first article <coughs> published in the Helsinki University uh, news, uh, news uh, paper. It was really very remarkable and everybody appreciated how India great, how India is great. You can see in Supreme Court, we have a different uh, member from different uh, states, culturally different, uh, religion, the religion speak they are very different and so forth, so on. 
So I proved to be that they say unity and diversity was the success of Indian heritage and culture, whatever it will say. Then I came back to Supreme Court in the year 1997. I studied my practice. My message was in that LinkedIn group, uh, LinkedIn, that if I can do something, who started my journey, who started the journey from a uh, the government municipal school to achieve the goal to become a senior advocate designated by the full court of the Supreme Court of India. So why not you can do, the, being a first generation lawyer, you can also do it if you have the courage. <laughs> and three things I, I have undertaken in my life, whatever life I have, that is honesty, integrity, and sincerity. You, many people have seen when the Friday group is going on, I am putting my designations anywhere because I have, to, I have given a, I have told to my client that I have to file the petition two days sir. So I was <laughs> sitting in that corner and I was doing the designation and all these things. So therefore three things a, if a lawyer has undertaken in his life, sincerity, honesty and integrity, I think this uh, the, the three plus of success. In According to me, what I have proved to be is which has been recognized by the full court of this honorable court. And I'm really grateful to Sheshu. And I'm I'm a member of the private private group since its inception. We started with this table, and it is continuing with this table. And I'm really grateful to everybody. And what I say, I'm grateful to Sheshu being honored today. And also and Russell said who has blessed us today in this felicitation program. I'm really grateful, you, sir. I want your blessings for you. Always, always. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Pijush. Thank you. In Corona's time, you went to a ventilator. Yes. 13 days in Apollo Hospital. Entire Friday group. Uh, Pray for me. Pray. And yes, I am grateful to Friday, Friday group members because they were they stood like in Mala and during my the Corona period. 13 days uh, in uh, ICU, 5 days in ventilation, 40 days in Apollo. But doc, when it was the blessings and prayer of this Friday group members, perhaps I am here today. Now I request a brief Abhakar, Senior Advocate, our Jyoti Senior. Ready, sir. We'll say one, two words. Friday family. It's an honor that has been bestowed upon me. But what I would like to say is, I'm a first generation lawyer. Started in the district court, which was a city civil court in Chennai. And even there, first six months, my seniors put me on to the job of a clerk. So I learned the entire clerical work first. First six months it was only purely going to the sections, interacting with the staff there, trying to pass our papers and getting our uh, planes <coughs> numbered. And after six months I was, I was, my seniors graduated me into arguing, into uh, appearing before the courts and cross-examination was the thing which they taught me. In cross-examination, they used to say that you must prepare questions, likelihood answers, and if a particular answer is going to be this way, then another question for that. So this is how we were trained. After about two years of practice in the city civil court, my seniors put me on to the high court where I was given the job of attending miscellaneous uh, petitions. There again, we had in those days good judges who would, the moment they see a, see a junior who is struggling, not able to answer, they will say, don't worry, take the papers, read it, we will hear you after an hour, come back, prepare and come back, we will we'll hear you. You just tell the facts, 
we will take care of the law. That is how it was. And they used to tell us the law after we finish. This is the law. And that made us <coughs> understand how it is easy to assimilate the whole concept of not only the facts and also merge it with the law that the judges were telling us. And gradually then I rose to the doing first appeal, second appeal, writs, and it is how it, the journey started and about 18 years of practice in the High Court. When I joined the bar uh, and before I was put into the office, one sitting judge, then sitting judge, Justice Ratna, whose father's portrait is here, Vishwanath Sastri. He asked me whether I will continue in the profession. Being a first time lawyer, you know, they have always have a doubt. We <laughs> leave in, the, in between and vanish. I promised him that I will continue. Then when I thought of shifting here, which was again an accident, sitting across in a lunch table, one senior in my chamber asked me, I am going to Supreme Court, would you join? I thought he was joking, I said, okay. The next week he bought a ticket and said, come, let's go. And that's how I landed here. It was not pre-planned. I had, I had no idea of what Supreme Court was at that point of time. I came here. My friends were there to help me out. They helped me. After this, Justice Ratnam retired. When I met him, I told him, I'm now in the Supreme Court. He said, you kept your promise. And he donated his entire library to me, which includes the books of Justice uh, Krishna Sas. I have those books with me. That's how my library has built up. <laughs> So, it only shows that hard work and perseverance can take you to any height. It is, if you sit back and you think that you have to relax, I think this profession may not be the best of it. It requires hard work and I'm sure all the junior members here will take a little cue from what I have said and raised to high standards and keep the flag of this institution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir. You nicely explained your experience and your senior Vishnu Sastri's portrait. We are not aware of honestly. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the great thing. Now I request Dr. Joseph Aristotle, please come. He's here. Yeah, please come. Good afternoon, all of you. And I'm very emotional and uh, it's, it's, it's very nice. It gives me a lot of pride to stand here this afternoon amidst all of you. I'm sure these uh, walls have witnessed many hardworking people here. And first of all, I would like to thank Sage Sir. 203 is not a joke here and it will keep going. I'm sure it's going to cut across more. And we thank Basan Sir also for his esteemed presence here and all other friends. Uh, I think on a Friday afternoon, I don't think I should take much more time. I would thank all of you for this, uh, for this opportunity actually. And uh, I thank the Friday group also for having all of me. And uh, I mean like what the other seniors have said, it's always hard work that pays. And we all have believed in it. I don't think I say anything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Starting from my subject, very short and sweet. Now I request Raven Srivatsa, please come. Good afternoon, uh, my respected colleagues. Uh, the one and the only Sheshu sir, uh, I am happy that I have been a part of this uh, group uh, since its founding days. And it was, it used to be a small group at that time. And it was so small that we would go for coffee in the coffee shop. <laughs> now it has grown beyond proportions and I am happy to share this with all of you today. Uh, I had shared this with uh, Sheshu sir. My late father, who uh, left me uh, a few months ago, uh, he was a trial lawyer and uh, he had about 65 years at the bar and he continued my grandfather's uh, legacy, his uh, office. Uh, and his vision uh, was impaired in the uh, latter part of his life, but he would never give up. Uh, 
in fact uh, people would insist that he should go to court and argue matters uh, he would take a colleague of his he would recall from his memory which authority to cite so the junior will read out from the authority he will argue on facts and state the law and ask the colleague to read out from the judgment and he somehow learned that friday group lectures are being webcast on youtube and in a small town in karnataka he got hold of it got a few people to organize uh, a mobile phone uh, every friday and he was a very keen follower of the youtube uh, uh, group of uh, friday group. so uh, uh, i am uh, really grateful and i have a confession to make although no formal charge has been framed against me <laughs> i frame a charge against myself and i plead guilty that i haven't addressed this group i have assured sheshu sir that at the earliest given opportunity earliest available slot i will do that and i share my thoughts with you thank you very much thank you raghavendra we love to invite him more we'll catch in the march or april thank you sir now finally devas is baruka today speaker also he to elevated last time he supposed to be but uh, he had out out station he could not have we we'll say few words sir thank you sir it's always a privilege and honor to be a part thank you so much sheshu sir for being uh, bringing me in fold into this friday group i think only one thing because i think a lot of speakers have already said quite a bit and i'm sure <laughs> one would want to move on so one thing which uh, apart from of course uh, the hard work one puts in i strongly believe that academics is equally an important part of our legal profession i remember the early days uh, when i had joined the profession after doing my masters and uh, across the street in indian law institute i used to go and give uh, as a as a visiting faculty some lectures and somebody did tell me that either you practice law or you give lectures you can't do both <laughs> but that's something i completely disagreed at that point of time and surely disagree even today i believe that everyone should take out time as much as possible from the busy professional life continue with the readings and attempt to reflect your thoughts in writing so that others also get to benefit from what your own exposure and thought process has been so that's a very small little advice i would have uh, over here thank you so much sir this is written by our baruka today's speaker he is going to speak on the same thing he is presenting to our friday group so in turn we will give it to library to through scba thank you very much baruka it's a thank you this Uh, Basan sir will say a few words about how we got this inspiration. Uh, people will they will say. <coughs> Honestly, tell me how many people are inspired from this uh, felicitation part? Yeah, Can you raise your hands? Everyone. Even me. Dear Mr. Sheshu, all brothers and sisters at the bar. I deem it an honor that Sheshu has given me this opportunity to be part of this felicitation function. Let me, on behalf of the entire Friday group, offer our felicitations to the to the newly designated seniors. <laughs> Unlike me, they have got their gown. They have earned their gown. i got it because i was a part of the judiciary i was a i was a farmer judge who came over here but i think these young people have earned it by the dint of hard work that they did let me let me offer my most sincere felicitations to all of you i keep repeating this excuse me for doing that again the gown is not an ornament it's not just an honor it places on your shoulders a very very heavy responsibility i want every one of the of the gown wearers including me to understand that this gown represents the finesse the sophistication the refinement the yen for learning of this profession please don't consider your gown as just an ornament 
which you can which you can trout before all the others. It's a great responsibility that is there on you. Excuse me, I don't mean to uh, say anything wrong about anyone. I come from what was originally where the writ of the Madras High Court ran, and we everything we used to look up to the Madras High Court as the as the bastion of all great practices. If a senior counsel raises his voice in the small little town that I come from, there was something really, really wrong. But coming to the Supreme Court, I find at times, not always, those high traditions are not being followed entirely. Raising of the voice, interruptions, etc., 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 I don't want to go into details, appear to happen here in this first court of the land very frequently. That is where a great responsibility lies on your shoulders. Please live up to the great traditions of this noble profession of law. As the wearers of silk, they used to call it the silk earlier, as the wearers of the silk gown, you have a great responsibility to ensure that the greatness of this profession is upheld. The primary axiom of the Bar Council is that the lawyers must first and foremost be gentlemen. No, no disrespect meant for the ladies. <laughs> gentlemen means uh, gentle persons only. I'm, I'm an old man bor borrowing old uh, expressions. Well, live up to that. That is what I would like every young member who has come to, to the, to, to the uh, has been conferred the gown to always realize that responsibility that this is not a mere honor. It is. It is a recognition of your work. But it's not an honor for you to take around. It's a heavy burden of responsibility on your shoulders to be outstanding role models for all those who are, all, all the younger ones who are here. Please understand that responsibility. Just one or two things and I'm done. Someone said that he, he started in a, in, in a, in a government school where, where uh, uh, English was perhaps forbidden till the fifth standard. Well, I come from one. I also had my education in the, in the, in the vernacular medium. Uh, in lighter vein, we used to say, we knew that the English had a spoken version only when we came to the college. <laughs> we, all, we all thought it was only in writing, alphabets and writing. It's only then that we... Well, language today is not that important for the profession at all. I want every one of the young people to realize, yes, good communication skills, very good. I think of the foolish days when I started in the profession, I wanted to open with a quotation from Milton and close it with a stronger one from Shakespeare. After I became a judge, when lawyers start doing this, what is going on in my mind, I may not have said that. Okay, okay, Milton is always, what is the point? <laughs> okay, Shakespeare is great, but what is the point? Today's lawyers, best armament, the best weapon is his power of analysis. Please understand that language, I mean, again, playing to the gallery, the, you, know, you, you, you see all sorts of techniques here. All that is just not important. What is today important is your dedication to your work, your analysis of your work, your ability to present that to the court in a manner which is acceptable. Gone are the days when rhetoric used to rule in the courts. No place for rhetoric at all. No place for rhetoric at all. The more difficult the words that you use, the less you're likely to be understood today. Right? Well, simple language, but effective communication of the ideas that you have. The power of analysis. What is a lawyer? A lawyer is basically a salesman of ideas. I sell ideas to the bench. I try to sell ideas to the bench. And then I must, I must package it well so that they buy it. For to that limited extent, all the other things have an importance, but your real strength is the strength of your wares, what you have got to sell, the strength of your ideas. And therefore it's important that all of us realize that. It's, the court is no more a place where rhetoric plays, where playing to the gallery plays, none. 
Today's quote is, is important because you've got to have an idea, you are on well-researched idea, well-analyzed idea, you put it across. Well, some people ask me, you've gone to the Supreme Court, how's, the, how's your practice? I would say, in the High Court, when a person argues, he has five points, he'll try to raise all the five points. For admission matter, when it comes, out of the five, you'll have to learn which is the best one that is going to appeal today before this particular judge that I'm, I, I, I'm going to appear. And therefore, choose the best idea that you have, try to put it across in the minimum words as possible, try to put it as effectively as possible, I think that is the practice in the Supreme Court today. And therefore, be not, be in any, any way diffident because my language is not as good as somebody else. Some people are making very good presentations with very impressive language. I want all the young people to realize that. That is unimportant according to me. It is the strength, your strength lies in the ways, the, your, your ideas, your power of analysis, the thoroughness with which you have prepared. I've taken long. Thank you very much. One more thing that I wanted to say was, I did not know that Chetu was going to invite me to make this, uh, you know, uh, or to do this honor for them or to make, uh, but I think I'm, I'm privileged. I'm, I'm most, most happy that Cheshu has given me that honor to honor all these young people. I, 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 I really appreciate the, the confidence shown by you in doing that. Please understand that the Supreme Court this time has really depended upon young people to carry the flag. Yeah. You must have yeah. seen it. Yeah. You, yeah. you must have seen it. Yeah. The future of this profession lies with the young people at this bar. It is for you to carry on this institution, the, the, the profession of law, to greater and greater heights. That I find, that I find a reflection of that in the type of young people chosen to award the silk. Old people like me are going out. No, we are no more important. This institution will depend upon how you carry yourself. And therefore, please, please make sure that you live up to the expectations, live up to the responsibilities on your shoulders, and carry this institution and the profession forward in a most admirable way. I am also very happy that I came today because in the manner in which Baruch has prepared this brief today is an indication I need to congratulate all the, all the young senior lawyers that if you will emulate him and do that. I've been watching him in court always. I've always said that I'm so impressed by the way he, as also some of the young people over here who have been given the gown, per perform in the court. I'm sure you will live up to the expectation. May God help you to live up to the great expectations and carry this institution and the profession of law and the noble profession of law. People have forgotten. People, it's becoming from a, what is the difference between a profession and a career? Well, at times we get confused, you know, we, are not, we are not very sure. A career is maybe uh, uh, one with which you earn your living. Profession is career plus, and that plus is perhaps the, the service dimension of the profession. Or the service dimension of the career makes it a profession and not a mere career. May you be successful in the in the profession that you have chosen to accept. May you be shining stars in the constellation of great lawyers. Walk around this court, you can find on the, on, the, on the wall of fame that you have many, many persons. May you all be inspired by that. And I do hope this profession has a great future, this, this, this institution of the Supreme Court has a great future. There are ups and downs. Sometimes you go through bad paths, sometimes you come up, sometimes you again go down. It happens. Nothing to worry about that. It's part. Every human civilization itself, you have seen the rise and fall of many civilizations. At times, it may not live up to our expectations. At times, you may feel frustrated. I have many times felt frustrated in the manner in which some of the things have happened in this court. I have felt frustrated. But I believe the, the optimism must continue and this profession this institution is the last bastion of an ordinary Indian citizen for whom the Constitution was framed. 
and therefore that burden is on you to live up to those expectations. Thank you very much. I think I'll listen to Lon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Very nicely inspiring words. Let us give a standing ovation to Basan sir and his valuable words to all of us. Uh, friends, today is the 203rd Friday group meeting. The topic is uh, the Indian Constitution, a paradigm shift from being ruled to being governed. The speaker is Mr. Devashish Baruka, senior advocate, and he also addressed our Friday group, uh, that is 160th Friday group meeting, that is dated 25th 11th, 2022. The topic was Employees Pension Amendment Scheme 2014, Impact of Supreme Court Judgment in EPFO versus Sunil. Kumar. Uh, Aruka, you can initiate on this thing. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, it's an honor again to come one month back to the Frederick Group and address this August gathering. And I thank you, sir, for inviting me once again. The topic today is slightly different. It's about how the Indian constitution <coughs> and uh, it reflects the paradigm shift of how it, we were being ruled earlier prior to the independence and how today we are being governed. And I think it's a fascinating uh, journey from being ruled to being governed. And uh, primarily it reflects upon the Indian mindset of how we were most comfortable in the way we were ruled by maybe by individual or by a certain family <coughs> right from the centuries onwards to how the constitution made sure that this entire system would shift over and change into a system of governance. So let me just start first with the whole idea of this Indian mindset and how certain people have reflected upon it. How Indians have been comfortable with the whole idea of having Raja and the Praja concept where there will be an individual who would be <coughs> ruling us and under whose regime or kingdom as subjects, as Praja, we would be happily or unhappily living. But nonetheless, we could have never imagined to actually overthrow those regimes because it was never in our thought, or in our mindset, in our frame that we can actually do that. And one of the uh, top writers, Leo Tolstoy, had this to say. He said that if the English have enslaved the people of India, it is just because the latter recognized and still recognized force as the fundamental principle of the social order. In accord with that principle, they submitted to their little Rajas and on their behalf struggled against one another, fought the Europeans, the English and now trying to fight with them again. So this, this small little expression, <laughs> this small little thought reflects upon how the outsiders, the people who would raid into India over the centuries, knew how the system is working, how we think about how the system should work and how the being ruled itself was most comfortable position for us. And in fact, Dr. Ambedkar, in fact, at the time when the constitution was being adopted, he realized this problem. He realized that we are not really ready for something like democracy. This was something which was new to the Indian system. This was something which wasn't there previously. We had never had the occasion of really electing people, having our own people on board through our own voting processes. And one of the criticisms was that why is it that the constitution is so long and so detailed? And what Dr. Ambedkar said was that constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. We must realize that our people have yet to learn it. That's exactly what he said at that point of time. Democracy in India is only a top dressing on an Indian soil, which is essentially undemocratic. In these circumstances, it is wider not to trust the legislature to prescribe forms of administration. This is the justification for incorporating them in the constitution. So fundamentally, Dr. Ambedkar realized at the time of framing of the constitution that we as Indians are not really democratic in the sense from our thought processes. We can't really imagine. So though overnight we are adopting the constitution, though over a period of three years and odd, the constitution framers did build up and incorporated the most relevant of the democratic provisions in the constitution after adopting them from across the world. But what the other countries had in difference was they had over the years adopted to the system, to the process, which we had not. And therefore it was essential 
that this particular <coughs> caution was placed by Dr. Ambedkar right in the beginning that we are essentially undemocratic but at the same time to make sure that the India progresses as a democratic country in the long run we should be able to have a detailed constitution detailed provisions incorporated having all institutions firmly placed with their rights with their duties with their limitations with their powers so this is where the mindset was when we started I'll just give a slight glimpse about how probably in the earlier 13th century the Mughals had started. When the Mughal came up in 13th century, clearly we were still in the process of that Raja and Kingdom. So for them it was in a way apart from having just coming into it, raiding and acquiring it forcefully. But that apart the mindset continued to have somebody who is ruling us at that point of time. So it was in those eras where clearly what one uh, Sir Thomas Rowe wrote about the Mughal era and said that Indians lived during the Mughal period as uh, live as fishes do in the sea. The great ones eat up the little. For first the farmer robs the peasant, the gentleman robs the farmer, the greater robs the lesser and the king robs all. That was the overall description of how the Mughal era was going into at that point of time. There was clearly no understanding or even appreciation or even imagination of something known as a fundamental right. There was slavery all over. Even children and wives were being sold as if there would be products in the market. So there would not be any question of any child rights or, or any kind of uh, uh, women rights. There was obviously no right to business. Any point of time by a farman or a dicta or a decree of the king, anybody's businesses could be closed down. There were naturally no right to property at all. Anybody's property could be picked up. <coughs> After the death of a person, it would be upon the king whether it should go off to succession and should go be a part of the king's treasury. There was obviously no concept of a welfare state. There was famine all across. There would have been complete right, and yet the king would not even bother in so long as his own treasury is being filled up. There could be completely unreasonable taxation or in terms of revenue collection. There would be no rights at all. So it was that kind of understanding and mindset where we continued and when we entered over few centuries ahead when the company, the East India Company came into picture. So the East India Company was incorporated <coughs> on 26th April 1599 uh, and a charter was uh, the, at that point of time the Queen's Charter which permitted them to trade. Now initially it was the company Raj where the whole idea for them is to just enter into India from different parts, set up factories like in Surat, Bombay and to have nothing but only trade. Over almost century and a half later, they realized that they can have something more. They can actually have more of political inroads with the consideration of the situation we had. And after winning the two uh, famous uh, battles of uh, Plassey and of Baksar, they eventually were able to have Dewan rights. Now, once they had Dewani rights, that's where the real trouble started. We again as Indians <coughs> probably had the same mindset. It could be either Mughals or it could be the East India Company officials who will come and rule us. So realizing that mindset which still continues at that point of time, they were able to have inroads into the system itself. And as they proceeded further, there was a lot of corruption which was happening. There was a lot of malpractices which the company was entering into. And this is what the words which came back to the British and the British Parliament. And they realized there is some problem which is happening. So by the end of the 70, 18th century, so 1700 something, 1773 onwards, Parliament, British Parliament slowly started interfering into the company system and they started having statutes and parliamentary laws for the purpose of regulating how the company would work. They would also have further people from their own representatives into the company working <coughs> that went on till the end of the 1800s and then after 1800s as we move forward slowly the role of the company Raj comes to an end though all those period as we would notice that all those same problem in terms of corruption in terms of having no rights for the Indians who were being ruled under the company Raj continued and then that eventually led us to the next major milestone which was the first war of independence where the Indians probably realized that there is something wrong which is going on and therefore they, the first mutiny, mutiny which eventually led the British Parliament to enter completely into the scene they removed the company, abolished the company rule and the British crown eventually entered into the scene the Queen made, was made the Empress of India we had the Viceroy of, the, of India <coughs> established in India and that's how henceforth it was the British Parliament and in true sense the British Raj which started. Again under the British Raj the situation was the same. 
nobody really concerned about in terms of the rights of the citizens, I won't say citizens, of the people, the Indians who were staying over here. It was again the rule which continued. Now, within the, these circumstances, Company Raj, as he moved forward, there were various acts which came about, which shows that slowly the Indians were made in some manner a part of the administration system. The first of the earlier acts, the Minto uh, Morley Reforms 1909 Act, which we are aware of. The second then was the 1919 Act. And then the lastly was the 1935 Government of India Act. Now these three acts progressively and slowly permitted the Indians to be a part of the system in some manner or the other. It could be very restrictive in nature. It could be certain elections being happening where certain seats would be reserved. There could be situations where, like in 1919 Act, there was a double government kind of thing, so there was a division where the areas which the Indians were given were something like education, etc. But the police order, etc. were still retained by the British officers. So this division, and yet there was some role, some involvement happening. But again, let's not make a mistake, the masses had no uh, control over it and they had no concern. They were comfortable in terms of what the rule was happening and they had no clue of what exactly election process is, what de uh, democratic process is. Because even ho over here, the electorate had a very limited number who were going over there. In this situation, 1935 Act, after 1935 Act, there was a gradual change in the mindset with respect to the mindset with respect to the uh, limited self-government. Parallelly, we had also the entire uh, uh, independent struggle which was going on which obviously involved in terms of a demand for a Swaraj. Swaraj where one expected that there would be complete independence. Swaraj along with Suraj, which is good governance. So these were certain concepts which were floating amongst the different uh, political parties. Our intellectual masses and especially the leaders, the freedom struggle leaders, they were very clear about the concept that they would eventually want full independence and a self-governance system and that the British Raj needs to come to an end. But that mindset clearly did not percolate down to the masses because that's something which was still not very clear. I think the masses still though were informed and they were part of the movement, but still they never believed that what exactly the democratic process would be. From 1935, I think the next major area which we are looking at is straight away the era when the independence process really started from the Britishers' point of view. So in 1947, the Prime Minister declared that there would be a transfer of power by June 1948. Now this era is again very important, in 46 itself, 47 though they announced it will be in 48, 46 itself, I'll come to the assembly debate and how constituent assembly came about, but there was already discussion about how a constituent assembly is equally required and which started in 1946 itself. But anyway, 47 they declared that we will have an independence act and we will have uh, independence by 48 June because of certain issues, certain problems which arose and especially the riots which started. Eventually, it was preponed, and the Independence Act, Independence Act, finally came about on July 18, 1947. Independence Act 1947 itself reflected many of the provisions with respect to how the governance of the country would work, which again I'll come a bit later. But once the independence comes into picture, now comes the issue of the formation of the Constituent Assembly, that I think was one of the earlier. Uh, I would say the reflections of the thoughts of the leaders as to how a document of governance would be created for the purposes of running the country. It was not in terms of how it would be ruled, but rather how to be governed. And the earliest one was reflected by Mahatma Gandhi in 1922, when he said, Swaraj will not be a free gift of the British Parliament. It will be a declaration of India's full self-expression expressed through an act of parliament. So of course he did not really coin the word constituent assembly, but clearly he believed that whatever document has to be created for the purposes of governance of this country, it must be through an act of parliament of India. It cannot really be the British parliament who creates some kind of a document and imposes upon us. Because that again would be reflective of something like an indirect rule. And I'll indicate in, the, uh, in, the, in, a, in my talk ahead how the independence act was treated eventually and why it was so treated. So Mahatma Gandhi in 22 in some way indicated that it should be an act of parliament which should govern the country. The next more authoritative, I would say more express 
declaration came about by one Swaraj party. Now, Swaraj party came about because the Chauri Chaura incident, if you all remember, that was withdrawn because of the Chauri Chaura incident, the non cooperation uh, movement was withdrawn by Mahatma Gandhi. There were few people in the Congress who were uncomfortable, so they came out and they created a Swaraj party. Swaraj party in 1934 says this. This conference claims for India the right of self-determination and the only method of applying that principle is to convene a constituent assembly representative of all sections of Indian people to frame an acceptable constitution. So 1934 Swaraj party was one of the earliest uh, political parties which declared that a constituent assembly is required and they are the ones who should eventually frame a constitution for the country. The Congress accepted this in December 1936 when it said that Congress stands for a genuine democratic state in India where political power has been transferred to the people as a whole and the government is under their effective control. Such a state can only come into existence through a constituent assembly having power to determine finally the constitution of the country. 1936 is what they say. 1940, the Muslim League accepted this position and eventually the cabinet mission in February 1946 when they came up with the entire proposals, they specifically said the proposed constitution making machinery should be immediately brought into force in order to enable the making of a constitution by the Indian themselves. They also indicated how the representation <coughs> has to be made and they said that since we cannot really have a direct election for the purposes of the members of the assembly and since we don't have the time, let us utilize from the present elected provincial legislative assemblies. So how the assembly, constitutional assembly really came about was from these people itself who were already elected members from the provincial legislative assemblies. So this is what the constitutional assembly formation was discussed over the time. This got reflected in section 8 of the Indian Independence Act. So se section 1 categorically Indian Independence Act says that now there will be two dominions, India and Pakistan. 8 is where it says that the constitution would have to be made by a body which is by each of these dominions itself. So that is where finally as you know at some point of time all those things all the issues got merged that India itself would create a constitution for itself and it will not be governed by any other sovereign power or by any other law. So this is where the foundation came about and that is why when 1946 and this is much prior actually even to the declaration of the British to give independence 1946 itself in July we had a constituent assembly in place. And its first sitting was in December 1946 to take out how, how things forward. And at that point of time, this is what they resolved. They said the Constituent Assembly declares its firm and solemn resolve to proclaim <coughs> India as an independent sovereign republic and draw up for her future governance a constitution. So clearly the mindset was slowly moving towards having its own constitution, having its own governance set up which a few centuries back could not even have been imagined and which over the se over the last few decades pre-independence because of certain parliamentary acts of the British 1909, 1919 and 1935 we started understanding how the constitution <coughs> would really be built up and how that this is how the governing system should take place in India for the masses, for the benefit of the citizens of the country. Having moved forward now, now in terms of how the constitution was really to be framed now, December 1936, 19, uh, 13, 1946 was the first resolution and there was an objectives resolution which was adopted by the assembly on January 22, 1947. Uh, this is an extremely important objectives resolution because this is where the fundamentals of governance of the country was laid down by the assembly and this for the first time that they adopted this kind of a fundamental saying this is where the principles enshrined in the constitution would be picked up from and slowly built up over discourses over the next few years so that we are able to build. And the first one itself I think is extremely important which says this constituent assembly declares its firm and solemn resolve to proclaim India as independent sovereign republic. Now these three words also have some importance. First, the independence itself is declared in January 1947, <coughs> second, it says it will be a sovereign. So it is not that we will be again any way dependent in any manner over any other sovereignty or any external power. India itself will be a sovereign in itself. 
and second democratic a democratic really would mean that we will be adopting the democratic procedure the democracy where the people would be electing the representatives and having complete full power in themselves these three words independent democratic or independent sovereign republic eventually in the preamble though got changed preamble uses the words sovereign democratic republic so there was some amount of discussion on this as to why is it that the word independence is vanished and sovereign has been retained so what was explained by dr ambedkar was that sovereign itself presumes independence so we did not really have the word independent though in resolution initially when we started framing the constitution we adopted the word independent probably because at that point of time india wasn't truly independent so therefore now that we have gained independence now that we have framed the constitution so therefore the preamble need not really have the word independent that is a part of the word sovereign so it says sovereign democratic republic that is how the preamble was originally adopted so this was first part which was important second extremely important part was it said wherein all power and authority of the sovereign independent india its constituent parts and organs of government are derived from the people i think this is where finally the mindset was clearly shifting across that from a single man ruler to the shifting of the entire authority to the people of the country so the fact that right in the beginning the constituent assembly members adopted this resolution and believed that the entire power now is <coughs> given to the people the sovereignty lies with the people of india and none else so that is something which is reflective of the change of mindset at the time when the assembly had started with the framing of the constitution so this objective resolution is something which is extremely critical the second part which came about before and probably not many of us would know there were, uh, we had a uh, mr b n rao who was made the constitutional advisor to the assembly now initially he was asked to maybe build up a framework of the constitution so what he did was after studying the constitutions across the world he prepared a questionnaire of 27 questions and he circulated the questionnaire for all across all the members for discussion and that questionnaire itself is a fascinating reading in terms of how deeply he thought about the governance of the country and how strongly he believed that it is the people who are finally the sovereign it's the people who whom the power retains and therefore the institutions which has to be built up would be for the governance of the country of the people there would not be a single person who would rule the country there would not be a single institution who would have full control unbridled power every institution's power and duties and rights would be clearly demarcated within the constitutional provisions everybody would have their own limitations and eventually in case they cross the line there would be a judicial review of each of those conditions <laughs> there would not be a single authority which would be outside the judicial <laughs> review so therefore this question had also in a way formed in some manner a foundation of how the whole thing was built up after this there was an appointment of a drafting committee as we all know dr b r ambedkar was the chairman and uh, he was the one who eventually as the discussions also show he was he was the one who really led the discussion and it's uh, absolutely fascinating to see that after all the amendments proposed while discussing these draft articles and after all those different discussions in the end always dr ambedkar would be called upon he would effectively the kind of authority he had and the firmness and the clarity of thoughts he would get up he would say i agree with this i disagree with this and nobody would really stand up to say okay then no we still question that if he need be he will say i'll give reason somewhere he'll say i don't even require to explain what i'm trying to say but dr ambedkar's role can never be under uh, sort of understated and in, uh, in, in drafting of our constitution now in terms of uh, the time taken i think it was uh, almost 2 years 11 months close to 3 years that we had taken time to build up this and the preamble was the last one which was adopted though initially it was thought that we should first start with the preamble adopted and those principles would form the basis for the remaining constitution but then there was a further discussion saying we already have an objective resolution which i just discussed an objective re resolutions adequately reflect what we want to say in the constitution so let the constitution be built up approved by them and at the end would the preamble come so the preamble is in fact the last one which has been uh, finally approved as the last step of the constitution and one of the most interesting things of course uh, the uh, this was adopted finally on uh, 
on November 26, 1949, and the last day when in 1950, January 24, 1950, when it was finally made into force, and then the assembly was adjourned sine die. Now, what is of importance is again in terms of the theme we are looking at is the two acts which was at that point of time governing the country really was the Indian Independence Act read with the Government of India Act 1935. Uh, so happens both of them are eventually repealed by the assembly through the constitution. So there was a whole discussion about why we should or we should not repeal it. Especially the Indian Independence Act because logically speaking that is where we are getting independence from. So we are kind of repealing the foundational document by saying the moment is it is uh, repealed then that means that there is something, there is no independence. But the discussions went on and said we cannot have a constitution of the constitutions. They said that so long as we continue with the Indian Independence Act, we will be in some manner wanting to be governed or ruled by that act. And it is necessary that we should not be. So we have to completely snap off that umbilical cord. It's important that finally we do away with this entire colonial regime. And now that we have adopted our constitution, Though Section 8 of the Indian Independence Act said that we have to make our own constitution, having done so, having completed the task, having had the fact that the sovereign is now finally firmly with the people of India, now that the assembly for which it was created has done its job, we have adopted unto ourselves the constitution of India, there is no reason why we should continue with the Indian Independence Act. So that's something which was finally repealed by the constitution. So having had this journey about how the constitution in some form, how it was built up and how the entire mindset changed. What were the founding principles of governance with the makers looked into? Again, from the point of view of how the things were changing. The first, of course, I have already indicated, but again I should indicate, is the sovereignty. The sovereignty of the uh, sovereignty which otherwise was all through with the British Crown, to shift it to a certain individual authority under the constitution or to a body or even to the parliament, those were the issues which came about and it was clearly uh, indicated from all fronts that it is actually the people who should have the sovereignty. There was even a discussion about when we say the we the people, what do you mean by we the people? And the entire discussion led about is it we the people means the people who are sitting right now in the assembly debate? Or is it the people who are the elected representatives? Or is it the entire country, all the people, each and every citizen of the country involves we the people? Because that is where the sovereignty would lie. So it is not that the Constituent Assembly while passing the Constitution says that I have adopted the Constitution for the people. Very carefully they said, we the people means the people of India are adopting unto ourselves the Constitution. Obviously it has to be a mechanism through a body, through an authority and therefore it was through the mechanism of elected representatives ultimately through the members of the Constituent Assembly. But it was we the people who created the Constitution, who adopted the Constitution and who are running the Constitution. That's the fundamental change of mindset would happen with the Constitution. Which probably earlier it has never happened because we never thought it from that point of view. Because it was always in the regime of rule. We never really thought of moving into the regime of governance by governing ourselves, the self-governance concept. So that is something which is very critical uh, to, to, to take into object. There's another thing about the form of constitution. What kind of constitution we should have? Should we have a unitary constitution or should we have a federal constitution? And that straight away went on to the con uh, question of how exactly are we looking at our entire system. Is it that India is just a, a conglomeration of states and states itself would have their own independent sovereign powers with India like the United States of America, so United States of India all coming just together but still some kind of a sovereign power retained by each of those states? Or is it at the end of it a single country, a single united country which states for, for convenience of administration? If it is the second part, then it has to be unitary constitution. So it has to be one country, one constitution and nothing beyond. So in Article 1, there was some, uh, some uh, discussion when it says Article India, that is Bharat is a union of states. Article 3 provides with respect to this different, uh, this one states which can be created and the areas and boundaries which can be carved out. So it was very clear that there has to be a unitary and a single unitary and they formed a union rather than a federation. But what Dr. Ambedkar clar clarified also, that at some point of time it can be a unitary, it can be also a federal. It all depends upon the situation. So the constitution has been built up in a way with its internal checks and balances. And depending upon the situation, sometimes it can be converted into a unitary system or it can be into a federal system. 
And Dr. Ambedkar, this is what he had to say. The basic principle of federalism is that legislative and executive authority is partitioned between center and the states not by any law to be made by the center but by the constitution itself. So not only are we ensuring that the people of India are sovereign in nature, we are also ensuring that the entire country is to be governed only by the constitution and that no law, even the states can make no law which is contrary to the constitution. It is not that they have their independent sovereign right which they can do. And therefore they are all indestructible union and states, all created for the purposes of governance alone and can be reassigned or redesigned within the four corners of the constitution. So that is the first part which probably was looked into in terms of how the form of the constitution would be. Second of course was the rule of law which was very carefully crafted and uh, put forth in the entire constitution because that is something which probably we were missing all through pre-independence clearly and definitely during the Mughal period and uh, also probably in the company Raj, British Raj to some extent when they sort of codified the laws and maybe made an attempt to have some kind of a more certainty on how one would be ruled but still in terms of rule of law and how it would be eventually uh, used to the benefit of the people that was the second important principle which was incorporated for the purposes of ensuring that there is a governance in the system. Then the next was the parliamentary system of governance which was introduced and which was adopted. Uh, at the time when this discussion was taking place, Dr. Ambedkar explained that what exactly would mean by the parliamentary system and the presidential system as that of US. He said there could be two things which needs to be looked into. One is the certainty in the system and one is the responsibility in the system. We need a certain executive as in a certainty, a stable uh, government, but we also need a responsible government. He said if we go by the presidential rule, there could be a stability of the government, but responsibility in some manner would reduce. And Dr. Ambedkar believed that what India really requires is more of a responsible government than maybe not such a stable government. What we need considering the mind, the, the past we had and the kind of rule, pro, rule regime, the system we had, we need a government which is responsible to the people and which is willing to do something which is towards the welfare of the people alone. So therefore, very carefully after distinguishing the two, he said that I believe that it is the parliamentary system which should be adopted in this country and that's what we proceeded with. Parliamentary, though it has its own certainties, we have been seeing over the last few decades uh, because of the coalition governments, the, the change of governments, the change of chief ministers, elections, re-elections. But at the same time, the parliamentary system being with the government as an institution is responsible to the parliament and through the parliament responsible to the people. And once in case there is some problem, the people as the sovereign, they have the power to vote or re-elect or not to re-elect the government back in power. So it is that kind of a system which was expected and which was finally created under the constitution where that the governance of this India would still remain with the people eventually because they would have a right to eventually vote out or vote in any government or any, any of these uh, uh, elected representatives. So that was another point which parliamentary system at India was uh, taken. Then second was with respect to, next was the democratic and republic form of government. Democratic of course in terms of how the democracy has to work. But republican is really means that the political power stays with people. So republican form of government again was another form which was very carefully adopted by the constitution makers. Another very crucial part probably again from our past history and our experience was the separation of powers where the, both the, uh, all the three judiciary, legislative and executive would lie with a single person and therefore complete, uh, 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 complete corruption or complete power holding would hand only at the hands of one or a few. It could be even in the hand of a Raja and Raja through that to the, to the people who are the helm of affairs and who are able to then take control of the people. So the separation of powers was something which was extremely crucial for them and that was something which was adopted. In fact, there was one uh, suggestion which was made by Professor K.T. Shah in 1948 during the assembly discussions. He said that let there be an article 40 capital A which says there shall be complete separation of powers as between the principal organs of the state namely the legislative, the executive and the judicial. So, so much was the mindset that people wanted that let there be a clear constitutional declaration in the form of an express provision 
that there is a clear difference in the three organs. Of course, it was not really accepted because they said there is Article 50, which to some extent does reflect upon separation of powers. And if you see the entire mechanism as a whole, clearly there are clear separation of powers with maybe a bit of overlapping, more as a checks and balances. So separation of powers was another thing which was extremely crucial. Next, of course, is the judicial system where you have an independent judicial system. I don't think we really need to look into more, but really the idea was, again, this is another one of the important factors which went into, into ensuring that the India enters into a smooth governance system. Directive principles of state policy, this is something which I picked up because it's, I found something very interesting. So when the drafting committee was going through, they made two forms of fundamental rights, justiciable and non-justiciable. So justiciable is what we today see as the fundamental rights, Non-justiciable is rarely but finally got into as a directive principle of state policy. And this was picked up actually from the Ireland Constitution, <coughs> Article 45, where also they have directive principles of social policy. So they had picked up substantially from there and they realized that there should be some kind of a mechanism which guides the state to create its policy while of course ensuring that the fundamental rights are not transgressed. Now, these directive principles is what Dr. Ambedkar called as instruments of instructions. He said this will form as instruction to the state, to the executive, to the parliament, that this is where your goal should be. I've given you a mechanism for the purposes of creating laws, for framing laws, for framing policies, but your goal is where it is laid down in the directive principles of state policy. And that's why the, the directive principles of state policy uh, <coughs> if we, if we start, it, it starts, the first of the articles says that this is fundamentals to the governance of the country. So these has some very rich and deep meaning to it, that where the framers believed that in order to move from this regime of rule to the regime of governance, it is not only necessary to create proper institutions, it is not only important to give sovereignty to the people of the country, it is not sufficient that we should give judicial review. We should also ensure that those people at the helm of affairs who are to govern the country should know exactly what they are to do. And please recall what I said in the beginning. Dr. Ambedkar believed essentially we are still undemocratic. And therefore it was necessary that all these provisions are kept in place in the constitution so that there is proper guideline available to the parliamentarians or to the policy makers as to what exactly is the role we are looking at for the purposes of governance of this country. So directive principles of straight policy is something which I found to be extremely crucial. <coughs> so these were the different arenas, these were the largest areas which in, to my understanding are reflective of how the constituent assembly makers ensured that we go smoothly into the rule, from the rule pattern to the governance pattern. Now there are just two or three areas which probably I would like to indicate and, uh, and then uh, probably close. One, there was this very interesting discussion about Privy Purse. Privy Purse is directly relatable to the kings and the rajas. This is where exactly why the... So when, when we had the independence, we had almost 555 princely states. All those had to be merged into the Indian regime. Now the Indian Independence Act, the moment it came, Section 71B declared that whatever understanding these princely states had with the Britishers have come to an end. They are for all practical purposes sovereign in themselves. They are all independent kingdoms all over across the country. So it was important that the assembly <coughs> makers are able to bring all those people together. So the Privy Purse was one concept which was introduced by, uh, by Sardar Patel. He was the one who was able to get them all on board and he suggested that we should have Privy Purse for all of these uh, princely states and the kings and, and, and the princes so that they get certain amount of money every year from the treasury. This obviously itself seems revolting. That these kings and rajas who otherwise have enjoyed the kingdoms all these centuries, why is it that today in independent India, when we talk about sovereignty with the people, when we talk about the institutions being accountable to the people, why is it that money should actually be going to the, uh, through these princely states on an annual basis? And the, the, the justification given by Dr. Uh, by, by Sardar Patel is phenomenal. He actually explained, he said, see what exactly are we looking at? We are looking at not only territorial integrity of the country, but also economic integrity. 
territorial integrity is happening because all these princely states are agreeing to come and be a part of India, which otherwise technically under the Indian independence act, they have a right to do whatever they want to do. Economic integrity because with all this entire, whatever their funds coming in, whatever their other uh, uh, economic value, economic benefits which the treasury is getting, he said, even just from one Maharaja, if you are able to have interest calculated, it is enough to cover all the privy pass. So it's not that we are in a loss situation, we are actually in a win-win situation. So privy pass is something which may be kind of, might be in, in some manner reflective of uh, the rule system earlier, but this justification of Sardar Patel is what's really read through. Eventually, of course, we know that finally it was uh, abolished and challenged over here and even that was struck, uh, that wasn't struck down, it was upheld. So privy pass is one thing. Another very interesting thing was the civil services and the IS officers. So when the company Raj started, they wanted people to work on board for the purpose of the trading. That's how the concept of civil servants started. Over the time, as they acquired more political control over the country or different parts of the country, these civil servants started uh, shifting into administrative positions and they started controlling sort of the masses for the purposes of the company Raj and eventually for the purposes of Britishers. Then Lord Macaulay sometime in 1800s came up with this report where he sort of more carefully structured this entire system and he also encouraged uh, so-called elite and educated Indians to be a part of the system. So that's how this entire system of civil services and the all India, especially IA services came about. So obviously during the independence struggle most of the freedom fighters have seen the negative part of these IS officers were mostly Britishers and those who were involved in ruthlessly uh, sort of massacring all the riots etc. <clears throat> so a question came about as to why should we even continue with this kind of an all India services post independence because this is again reflective of what the British Raj is. Now it so happened that Britishers itself at the time were very concerned about these people who are as IS officers at that time uh, the civil service officers. So they had an arrangement with the government that once independence their services would also be protected in some manner and that is then reflected that arrangement is reflected in the Indian Independence Act that their services would continue even after independence still the justification as to why this all India services is to continue when this article came out for discussion a lot of the members objected saying that this is something we had been fighting against and why is it that we are continuing with this system of IS officers what Sardar Patel again got up and he said something was this. He said the union, in fact he cautioned. <coughs> he observed that the business of a member of the service, the civil services, is to serve the government. It is not really connected with which government, it is to serve the government. And he said the union will go. You will not have a united India if you have not a good all India service which has the independence to speak out its mind, which has a sense of security that will stand by your word and that, after all, there is a parliament of which we can be proud where their rights and privileges are secure. So he was quite categorical that IS officers, though they might be reflective of the British Raj, it is important that this institution as a whole should continue because it is this institution which effectively has been the backbone for the administration of the entire country. And today we are entering into a new regime. We have just been independent. India needs to be strengthened together and therefore this All India Services is required. So I believe that this IS continuation of uh, this entire civil services is also extremely important and why it continued. The last one is about the police forces. Now the police forces is normally understood for the purposes of maintenance of law and order. Now if we see, it's, if we can sort of break this to maintenance of law and maintenance of order. These are two independent things which we need to keep in mind when looking at why the police forces issues is coming up. Now, at the time of Britishers, what they were more concerned was not maintenance of law, but rather maintenance of order. When there would be riots, where there would be independent uh, struggle movements, they would make sure that the police officers should have enough wherewithal and expertise to, to be able to make sure that they are able to finish off all those rights. So when the issue came about as to uh, prior to 1861 that we need to have an Indian Police Act and in what format it should be, they had two choices. One was the, on the basis of the uh, Royal uh, uh, Constabulary, Irish Constabulary, RIC. Royal Irish Constabulary 
who were basically more on the military side and who were to actually required for the purposes of controlling the crowds, maintenance of order. Other was the London Metropolitan Police who was really for the purposes of maintenance of law, who would be not so formal, who would not really be in terms of, you know, have more friendly approach to the people. But the entire act was built up in a manner to ensure that there will be maintenance of order in the system because that was the requirement of the Britishers. And it had nothing to do with the governance, it was really for the purposes of rule. So it was that law and order situation and that is what even continued. And I believe the act still continues, there's still been discussions. Obviously that was something which we had to continue because that police forces were required. But that's an era and, de and debate which continues even today that for the purposes of maintenance of uh, law, maybe we need to have a complete different setup because still it is reflective of the rule system rather than the governance system. So police is something which is another area which I'd wanted to touch upon. So this is, this is really the, the, the initial parts of the discussion which uh, I've had the narrative uh, in, in the writing I had in terms of how we have moved on from this entire concept, how the Constitutional Assembly debates, uh, or Constitutional Assembly sat, how they discussed and they built up. After that, of course, is the various institutions which have come up, apart from the three basic institutions which we always talk about, as important institution as an election commission, which would be directly relatable to the democracy and right to vote, as important as even a, a, a UPSC. So these are the different institutions in terms of different adjudicatory bodies. And then the norms, how the law has been built up, how the executive policies are built up, how the judiciary takes place and finally in terms of the e-governance. So those are all checks and balances which have been built up in this constitution all with the idea of shifting over from the theme of rule to being governance. I mean, that is all I would like to speak on and I thank you so much for all of you to be here. I'm grateful to the final group for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Baruka. So nicely explained everything. It seems to you covered everything. In this book, uh, well researched document yeah. looks like yeah. I mean, it covered a lot of efforts, continuation of your father's legacy and all. So, Minto, Marley, and the 1935 Act, the contribution, and BN Rao's further advice to this uh, Constituent right. Assembly, what not everything, I mean. Thank you very much. We really enjoyed it, I mean. Uh, uh, wonderful.